Coming up tonight on YCN News, we hear from the victim of an armed home invasion that took place yesterday. Party lines continue to concern Governor Hassan in the planning of the budget. And skaters have a new skate park to look forward to in Brattleboro. For more news, weather, and sports, it's time for YCN News, your local view. Now, your daily digest of the Dartmouth Lake Sunapee region, Southern Vermont, and Windsor County. News, sports, weather, and all that is happening in our area. The news on YCN, your local view. Good evening. It's Tuesday, June 16th. I'm Kurt Weedy. Welcome to YCN News. Well, today is a much better day for George's Mills businessman, Speck Bowers, than early Monday morning. Bowers was hit on the head during an armed home invasion yesterday morning by a man he knows. The man charged by police with the assault, 29-year-old Brandon Green of New London, New Hampshire, tied Bowers up and pistol whipped him. YCN News spoke today with Bowers, also a former state rep and chairman of the Sullivan County GOP. Yeah, I'm feeling fine. Uh, it really was not a, a bad entry. And there are times yesterday when I thought the staples that were put in to fix the entry were worse than the injury itself. And the main problem yesterday was I didn't have any sleep. Uh, and last night I had a solid 10 hours and that really makes a difference. Bowers owns and manages George's Mills Cottages along Lake Sunapee. We asked about his tenant's reaction to the break-in. I might have been a little worried that they might be nervous themselves, but uh, no, the uh, the long-term guests are, uh, are not worried. Uh, they're kind of maybe a little glad that uh, the guy's been caught. Uh, and my, uh, my short-term guests here for uh, Actually, they're celebrating high school graduation. Uh, they, I don't think, think anything about it. They're out swimming and boating and having fun. And uh, so, so far, it doesn't really seem to make a difference. Bowers told police he recognized Green as the alleged suspect when Green spoke to him. Green, in court yesterday, denies he is the person who bound and gagged Bowers. Bowers does not speak ill of Green. He's been here, I think, about two months. Um, and... Um, I mean, we weren't friends in any sense, but I, I certainly uh, heard his voice many a time, talked with him um, uh, several times. Um, uh, it was just another tenant. Um, uh, frankly, I, there were times when he was a small problem, uh, not enough to really make a big deal out of, but... Uh, I did get complaints about him from uh, from other guests a couple times, um, but uh, I had no reason to feel bad about him in any way until yesterday. Now, despite what happened, Bowers explains his philosophical approach going forward. I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to install an alarm system um, so that I won't be sound asleep if anybody comes in. I, might even program the the system to have the sound of barking dogs and maybe scare away somebody. Uh, um, I, I don't think I'll make big changes because you shouldn't let something that happens once in your lifetime. I'm, I've been here 15 years without a problem and I suddenly changed my entire lifestyle because of one bad event. No, I'm not going to do that. I will make small changes. Green remains held in county jail on $100,000 bail. A probable, probable cause hearing next week in Claremont District Court is scheduled. YCN News will bring you more updates. Well, with the New Hampshire state budget still under construction, Governor Maggie Hassan remains concerned of the political divides shaping the spending plan for the next two years. Today in Nashua, Hassan says she wants the state's Republican leaders to know she wants to work with them to ensure the budget serves all of New Hampshire's needs. The budget is now being debated by House and Senate members from both GOP and Democratic parties in the Committee of Conference. The budget produced by the committee will go to the governor for review. Hassan, in a news release, says the budget as it now stands is cutting out money for economic needs for the state, including higher ed funding, public safety, health care, and road repair. Hassan also says she has spoken to Republican legislative leaders to let them know common ground can be found and she is not philosophically opposed to their plan to lower business taxes. 
With compromise and good faith negotiation, she tells members of the Nashua Chamber of Commerce a budget that works for the state as a whole can be set. Turning to Southern Vermont news, it's been at least 10 years in the making, yet a skateboard park will be built in Brattleboro. The Brattleboro Reformer reports that a 6,500 square foot park will be sited at the Living Memorial Park on Guilford Street. In addition to the skateboard park at the location, an 8,000 square foot dog park is, is among the design approved this week. The board's vote on the plan after a public hearing was 5 to 2. Noise ordinance and zoning issues also must be followed. Both parks must be kept clean and dog walkers must pick up, up, pick up after their pets. The projects are being built for without town money. Project supporters must raise money for both parks too. It will cost a little less than $200,000 to build the skateboard park. Now the next step is design how the parks will look. Well, coming up on YCN News, Dartmouth College gets a boost to its math department. An anonymous donor helps feed the hungry in our area, and a historic aircraft will make its way to New Hampshire. More news, sports, and the end of the week forecast when YCN News returns. The YCN News continues in a moment. Welcome back to YCN News. I'm Kurt Weedy. Well, when it comes to math, students of all ages have often asked, when will we ever use this in real life? Well, Dartmouth College math students have just been given a large donation that will help them answer this question. The college has announced that it has just received a $20 million gift from Dorothy Byrne, a philanthropist from Aetna. Additionally, three new trustees have joined the board of trustees, one of which graduated from Dartmouth in 2005, that according to the Valley News. The, do the donation was given in honor of Byrne's deceased husband, Jack Byrne, and, and includes a matching donation of $5 million in gifts to other parts of the college. Dartmouth is also planning to implement a 35000 graduate fellowship, which will be awarded to one member of the senior class each year. Staying on the donation beat, the Fall Mountain Food Shelf has received an anonymous cash donation totaling $1,000. The Eagle Times reports that one of the food shelf's founders said that as she worked yesterday morning, a man came in, asked what the shelf's donations go towards, donated money of his own, offered kind words, and then left. Around 1,000 residents in the area are aided by the food shelf, and the, and the donation will go towards feeding them as well as for gas and maintenance of the delivery van. The Fall Mountain Food Shelf has also been contacted by a second anonymous entity, an organization that said they will match a $10,000 fundraising goal if it is met by August. Now, if you, would, if you would like to contribute towards this goal you can or donate food, you can do so at the shelf's location on Route 12A in Langdon, New Hampshire, weekly from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. And finally, historic aircraft enthusiasts in New Hampshire will have to be patient for a few more days if they want to see the famous B-29 Superfortress bomber. The, world, the world's only flying B-29 has been delayed during a tour by inclement weather in Rochester, New York. The bomber, nicknamed Fifi, is the same type of plane that dropped the atomic bombs at the end of World War II. Fifi was manufactured in 1944, has since been restored, and is currently maintained by the Texas-based Commemorative Air Force, that according to the Associated Press. The, air the aircraft was originally scheduled to arrive on Nashua on June 18th but is being pushed back because of the inclement weather in Upper New York. Now, if you would like to see the plane for yourself when it arrives, the event is open to the public. A mission is $10. Coming up on YCN News, River Valley Chronicle host Elizabeth Durazio took the opportunity to speak with Mary Hope Rennie. Mary is a part of Keller Williams Real Estate. We'll hear their talk when YCN News returns. The YCN News continues in a moment. Welcome back to ICN News, I'm Mike Pizzone. Well, it was another dark and gloomy day out there, but it looks like things will begin to brighten up in time for tomorrow. Clouds will start making their way out of the area this evening, with temperatures falling to about 57 degrees and winds of up to 5 miles per hour. Skies will be clear in time for the early morning hours tomorrow, making for a bright sunny day with a high of 75 degrees before bottoming out at about 53 after sunset. From there, there's a slight chance we could see a little more rain, with a 30% chance for showers before noon on Thursday, with otherwise partly sunny skies and a high of 77. Those chances for rain increase into the evening, with a low of 60. Now let's take a look at our community calendar to see what's happening in the region. 
A Welcome to Medicare workshop will be held tomorrow beginning at 2 p.m. in the conference room at the new Sullivan County Service Link Resource Center on Elm Street in Claremont, New Hampshire. The workshop is designed to help new Medicare enrollees make more informed choices. Call the number on the screen to find out more. A family game day will be held tomorrow from 3 to 7 p.m. at the Silsby Free Public Library on Main Street in Charlestown, New Hampshire. Bring your own board games or use the libraries or join a group of growing cribbage players. Master herbalist Cindy Hubbard will be at the Rockingham Library on Westminster Street in Bellows Falls, Vermont tomorrow at 6 p.m. to share her knowledge on safe herbal remedies and much more. Visit rockinghamlibrary.org for more information. Last night we brought you highlights of all four championship games held over the weekend featuring our local teams in the Twin State area. So for the rest of the week we thought we'd break down those games even further, beginning tonight with Springfield Softball. The third ranked Cosmos knew they'd be in for a tough task in Saturday's Division II title game against top seeded and unbeaten BFA Fairfax, but it was Springfield who struck first to the tune of a 1-0 lead in the top of the first inning. Junior shortstop Brooke Wiley started things off for the Cosmos with a leadoff walk and advanced to second shortly after on a perfectly executed sacrifice bunt by the team's semifinal hero and sophomore Lena Geyer. From there, senior third baseman Chelsea McAllister didn't hesitate with a runner in scoring position, driving in Wiley with the game's first run on this triple to the wall in left field. Unfortunately for coach Andy Bladika's team though, the lead didn't last long as this RBI single in the home half of the inning knotted things at 1-1 before this pass ball allowed BFA Fairfax to cross the plate with what proved to be the game-winning run. The Bullets added one more run in the opening frame on this single up the middle to take a 3-1 lead, but Cosmos ace Jay Twombly induced a pair of pop-outs to end the inning and keep the deficit at two. Bullets ace Kayla Matheu didn't give up much from there though, surrendering just two more hits in the contest on this one-out double in the top of the second by Alyssa Lucius, and a leadoff single here in the top of the fourth by sophomore first baseman Cassidy Otis. BFA Fairfax, on the other hand, padded its lead with a single run in the bottom of the third on this RBI single to shallow left, before rounding out the game scoring in the bottom of the sixth on this shot to the gap in left center to make it a 5-1 game. The Cosmos looked to make some noise with the runner on in its final at bat, but the Bullets handled this bunt with ease to clinch the program's third title in the last four years. Twombly pitched well despite suffering a loss, allowing just three earned runs on six hits while striking out five in what was Springfield's most successful season since they won it all back in 2011. Be sure to check out tomorrow's broadcast when we break down the Sunapee baseball team's fourth trip to the title game in the past five years. That does it for YCN Sports, I'm Mike Pizzone. Thanks Mike. Tomorrow he will have a closer look at Sunapee baseball's Division IV title game. Coming up next, YCN's Capital Connections host John O'Connor spoke with retired U.S. Army Colonel Clint Granger about the Vietnam conflict. We'll have part two of that conversation when YCN News continues. The YCN News continues in a moment.